Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Verse 15. Verse 15 and First Peter chapter 3. And the title of the sermon tonight is Debunking Some Dumb Things. Just debunking some dumb things. <laughs> Y'all stand with me in honor and reverence of God's word tonight. I'm telling you one of my favorite verses. One of my favorite verses. Whenever I, I see 12, about 12 years ago when I came out here on the fifth Sunday of January, this is the um, scripture I preached out of. This one right here. This one right here. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man to ask if you a reason a uh, hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, and just for the, just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you would just honor your name tonight. With all that's said and done, thank you for the beautiful song service. God, thank you for the 5 o'clock hour. I had a great time in class. We just love you today, Lord. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Debunking some dumb things. Literally, literally, sometimes whenever you look at this verse, you know, whenever you look at verse 15, one of, one of the greatest aspects of it is it speaks of having a defense for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It speaks of, you know, how a lawyer, when he goes to court, has a defense, you know, for the person that he's defending. It speaks of being ready. It speaks of being prepared. You can imagine all the hours that go into a court case that a lawyer does. You can imagine all the hours that go in that specific case, but also you can imagine all the hours, you know, that, that went into just getting prepared as a lawyer overall, knowing the laws, going to law school, going to regular school, you know, all those things that a lawyer does. They spend piles of years in school getting ready, and then they have to actually take each case and look at the details in each case and go at, you know, that case in, in that way. And so whenever you look at um, God's command to us as Christian people to defend the gospel in the world that we live in and to be defenders of it, you've got to understand some things. One of the things is that he said to do it with meekness. He said to do it with meekness. I, I want to tell you something, though. Meekness there is speaking about doing the right thing at the right time in the right way. It doesn't speak about weakness, it's just meekness. It tells you to be meek. I want you to flip over with me to the book of Matthew. I like love these scriptures, and I don't know if you get the oomph out of them, but there's some oomph in them. If you turn over to chapter 26 of Matthew, I just want to kind of read these verses to you. These are verses where Jesus is standing before Pilate, when Jesus is being tried before he's crucified, okay? So this is kind of what's going on. In verse 57 of chapter 26 of Matthew, it says, and They had laid hold on Jesus, led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest. And it's, or This is talking about when he's before Caiaphas, my bad. But anyway, before the high priest and where the scribes and elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off into the um, high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. So now the high priest and the elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, there were many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. See, this right here, one thing I love about this, this is kind of a little rabbit trail, one thing I love about that right there is the, a false witness came and said that Jesus said he could tear down it and build it again in three days. It wasn't that Jesus, what Jesus said was false, it's that they didn't understand what he was saying. You got to understand, when you don't agree with what God said, what Jesus said, and he's not going to be wrong. You're going to end up being the one wrong. I guarantee you, after he resurrected and after he rose again, and the chief priest and all the, this fellow right here heard about it, he understood what he meant by that then. But we'll go on. Look what he says. It says, And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answer thou nothing. And what is this which is witness against thee? He's saying, you know, are you going to, are you going to, you know, say something back? Or, you know, are you going to rebut what, what was just said? Or, you know, have you got anything to say for yourself? And it says, But Jesus held his peace. And look what it goes on saying. It says, The high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God. He's saying, he's saying, listen now. He said, I want you to, under oath right here, it's like a trial. I want you to say, and he, he just, I mean, the high priest is sitting here trying God himself, and then he brings God into the equation. But look what he says. Look what he says. 
Tell us whether thou be Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, nevertheless I say unto thee, unto you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. I know like in English that doesn't have the thump that it had when Jesus was standing there. But basically he said, yes, I am him. Yes, I am him. And he, I'm telling you right now, he's saying, you're going to be sorry for what you're doing right now. So he says, I'm going to be on the right hand, a place of power. He's saying, I'm coming back in power. Next time when you see me, it's not going to be in this way. See, what Jesus did is he held his peace at the times that the Father wanted him to hold his peace. But when it was time to say something, he said something. I, that's what I want you to get out of this tonight, is that when it's time to hold your peace, you need to hold your peace. But what the world wants us to think as Christian people is that God wants us to hold our peace all the time, and that's not so. He didn't want Jesus to sit there quietly the whole time, but there were times that Jesus was instructed by his Father to be quiet. But when it was time to speak up, he let it rip. Amen? There's times when you need to say something. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When you look at defending the gospel, when you look at um, chapter 3, verse 15 in 1 Peter, you know, when we think about defending the gospel, we think about explaining what it is. Okay? But sometimes, sometimes there's a place and there's a time for saying what it ain't. Sometimes there's a time and a place for saying what it ain't. Now, listen, there, there's two things before we kind of dive into it I want to say. One thing is, sometimes people are speaking about things they don't know. Now, I'm going to tell you something about lost people. I love lost people. I understand that lost people are lost people. God loves lost people. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for lost people. Are you with me? But I want you to understand something. There ain't a lost person on this earth knows what being saved is about. They can hear about it. They can read about it. I can tell you, I heard my whole life about it. But when I turned 21 years old and I got saved, that was a whole different situation. I'm, I'm telling you tonight, that's a whole different situation. I mean, all that that I've been told, I've sat under sermon after sermon after sermon in a church. I sat in Sunday school after Sunday school after Sunday school. And, and listen to me, I never got what I got in the, just the minutes of the time that I accepted Christ. But yet we, we used to hear people out in the world all the time speaking about something they don't know about. They try to tell us what Christianity is and it ain't. That ought not to be so. They should not be the voice about what Christianity is. We should be. But too many times we hold our peace when we should be speaking. Listen, listen. They don't need to be speaking about things they don't know, but also listen. Sometimes we know some things that we don't speak about. <laughs> Let that sink in now. Sometimes you know some things that you don't speak about. What are some things that people say about Christianity that aren't true? Just think about that. I, I got like a, that was rhetorical right there. I'll get to an answer in a minute, but I, I want to read you something. I want to read you something that somebody had posted today. And, and I just tell you, sometimes you look at things and you see things and you're like, parts of it are true and parts of it ain't. All right? So they had this thing, I, I, don't, I can't remember, I think, I, well, whoever's in here that posted it will know anyway. It's nothing bad. Okay, I'll go ahead and say that. But it was just a thing on Facebook where they were talking about if you were born in a certain month, you were a certain way. And one thing Evan posted on it was, yes, yeah, some of these things about me are true. Some of the things, and that's how it is. Out there in the world, they talk about Christianity. They talk about Jesus all the time. Now, I'm telling you right now, they might talk about him in a hateful way. They might talk about him in a nonchalant way, but they talk about Jesus. Christ and Christianity is brought up all the time. All around us. All around us. Listen to me. But this is what they said. Who in here was born in the month of, uh, let's see right here, of July? Who was born in July? Okay. Let me tell you, let's see if this describes you. Who, who is now? Oh, Lord. You know this can't be true. I already know what it's fixing to say. I was too. I was born in July too, okay? So I read mine first, all right? This is what it said. People born in July are bubbling with enthusiasm. 
Raise your hand if you were born in July. Let's see. All right. Bubbling with enthusiasm. I'm, I think that's how Hardy would describe Ms. Carol. <laughs> All right. Friendly nature. This is the one, this is the one that got me, knocked me in the head right here. It said that I'm quiet and restrained. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Deep thinker. Good sense of humor, loving and caring toward near and dear ones. Sharp mind. Now, I can agree with some of this. Sensitive. Oh, God. A fun person, forgiving nature. Lord knows in Christ, but not naturally. <laughs> not naturally. Unpredictable at times. Stylish dresser. See, I knew this was coming. <laughs> Peace lover. Spiritual at times. Dedicated and hard work. I'm just saying, like, they just randomly throw some stuff out there, right? And, and But you just know that's not true of everybody born in July. Listen listen to me. Listen to me. You got, you got to know the person, right? You got to know the person. If you know the person, you'd know that some of those things may be true and some of them ain't. Listen, we need to make sure that the things that are being said about Christ are accurate. Now, you do need to use wisdom in when and where and know when to go and when to, when to be, at, you know, be peaceful the way you are and not say anything. There are times for that. You need to use wisdom in that. But I'm going to tell you something. We don't need to just let it go. You know there's been times at work that people have said things about Christianity that are not true. One of the things I thought about, I don't know about you, one of the things I thought about that people say sometimes is that it's boring. You ever heard anybody say that? Hey, they ain't riding the same train I'm on. I'm just telling you. They ain't on the same train I'm on. They ain't, they ain't going down the same street. There ain't nothing boring about it. Listen, flip over to 2 Corinthians. I want to read to you what happened to Paul. <laughs> what happened to Paul? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 21. And I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak, howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they a seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, and deaths off. Listen to what went on with this man. Of the Jews, five times received thy forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the false brethren. I can say, say he was in perils a lot. In weariness and painfulness and watchings often in hunger, in thirst and fastings, in cold and nakedness. The man ended up naked at some times. I mean, honest to goodness, listen to this now. Beside those things that are without which come up upon me daily to care about the churches. He, man, I'm telling you right now, you think that was boring? You think that was boring? Does that sound boring to you? Think about, think about this. Think about all the, all the time this week they talked about clarity. And, 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 you know, they talked about this week with that memo coming out, you know, in the politics or whatever they talked about. You know, we need to be where transparent where we can know what's going on. I want you to think about tonight all the beer commercials people are going to watch. What, it, what does it look like on them commercials that it is? Yeah, they, they do that. They do that, right? They do that. They pay people a lot of money to come up with those commercials. And they pay a lot of money for those commercials. You say, why is that? Because it is effective. They wouldn't pay that kind of money if it was not effective advertising. You know what our greatest advertising is? When you show up to work on Monday morning. When you show up to work on Monday morning. You know what the greatest advertising is? When you show up at your house after going to church. You know what your greatest advertising is? When you go out on visitation this week and then somebody comes to church the next week, you tell them how fun it was when you went. It was fun. I got to hang out with a red-bearded guy. I mean, anytime you do something with a red-bearded guy, it's got to be fun, right? I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. <laughs> That's why you keep him around, ain't it, Dwayne? 
I call him the red-headed assassin. <laughs> Little kids just love him. How are you doing, ma'am? He's got that sweet southern voice, man. The whole family just falls in love with him. But listen to me. They do all that advertising. You say, why? Because it works. Because it works. Because people don't see the end of it. Listen to me, if we, don't, if we don't stand up and we don't say what Christianity isn't, if we don't let them know it's not born, if we don't let them know, you know, that it's fun, who we is? You think the devil's going to do that? You think worldly people are going to do that? They don't understand it. They don't get it. It's just like before you have kids. You look at kids and you think to myself, my goodness, i got to pay all that money. I'll never get to do anything again. We can't go out on Friday night. I mean, a dirty diaper, oh my gosh, it stinks. I mean, like before you have a kid, but then when it's born and it's in your hands, you're like, oh my gosh. I mean, your whole world changes. I mean, honestly. You know, when is the last time you told somebody something great that went on in your Christian life? You ever think about that? You ever think about that if you hear in your break room at work or you hear in your office at work people talking about all the worldly things that go on and that they do and they talk about that, that side of that. You ever think about it, instead of arguing with them all the time, instead of just beating down what they're living, you let them know how good the way you're living is? You ever thought about that? You ever thought about being, be, being very thought out in the way that you do that? You ever thought about being very prayed up in the way that you do that? Because listen to me, it is very important. That is a very important aspect of being a Christian because listen to me, a lot of those people, you're not going to get in here for me to tell them. First, they're going to see it in you at work and they're going to hear it in you at work. It's not just important for them to see you smiling, it's important for them to know why you're smiling. It's not just important for you to look peaceful in the midst of a storm. It's important for them to know why you're peaceful in the midst of the storm. See, like, see, like we have this great paper written of our life and we leave off the bibliography. We leave off the credits at the end. Sometimes it's because, sometimes it's because we're nervous about saying something. Sometimes it's because we want to take the credit. I promise you, there ain't no plagiarism going on no Greg Carter. I ain't got to worry about copyright no. You got to say something good first. But listen, what is the gospel called? Good news. Good news. What do you need to do with good news? You need to spread it. You need to tell it. It'll take care of itself. I promise you. I promise you. What's some other things that people say about Christianity? What's the things that they say at your work? Or you've heard sometimes that, that you that aren't true. What's some things you personally have heard? Don't everybody speak at once. Waste of time. Waste of time. A crutch. See, I thought about both of those earlier today too, but I went to the boring and not fun part to start with. A waste of time. A waste of time. Slaughterhouse religion. Do you do you really think it's a waste of time? I'm telling you right now, you're here on Sunday night. I can tell you, if you're here on Sunday night, if you're here on Wednesday night, I can tell you, I can tell you, can tell you there's, something, there's something driving you. You think there's something to it. All right, so you don't think it's a waste of time. You invest your time. But when's the last time you told somebody how great of an investment it is? Help me again, Mark. What do you... What, what, did, what was the other thing said? What did you say, Nick? A crutch. A crutch. Jesse the Body of Ventura said that. He was very entertaining, but very ignorant when it comes to Christianity. Listen to me. A crutch? Is it a crutch? No. It is not a crutch. I didn't need a crutch. A crutch wouldn't get it for me. God had to lift me all the way up. <laughs> I ain't going to step further without him. Hey, I'm telling you, he don't just assist me. He does the whole thing. A crutch? 
Now, what do you mean by slaughterhouse Christianity, John Ed? Say that in redneck. I got you. I got you. It's too bloody. It's too bloody. Yeah. I get what you're trying to say. I get what you mean. It's too violent. It's too bloody. Like, why did Jesus have to be crucified? See, they're ignorant of the weight of sin. They're ignorant of the wages of sin. They take death lightly. That's why they're playing with sin. That's why they're playing with sin. They don't know they're playing with a rattlesnake. I'm telling you. He, he, said, he said to have your defense ready. So you're sitting here right now, and I guarantee you right now, God's running you back through some times when you've been sitting in your break room where you've heard some things. Listen to me. I know we say what it is if someone asks, but sometimes we need to say what it ain't. Sometimes we need to speak up. Sometimes we need to talk about it. Listen, that very, these very verses talk about what John Ed was talking about. Listen to what it says on down there. It says, Having a good conscience, whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed to falsely accuse your good conversation to Christ. You got to be living the life. That good conversation to Christ is talking about you're living. The conversation there, that word is talking about life. The way you live. The way you go about it. But look what it says. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. What, what it says in verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins and the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. I'm telling you right now, God done that so that he could bring us to God. In other words, God gave up his life so he could bring us to God. Listen to me now, listen to me. So we've got to give up our life so we can bring God to them. I don't mean in the sense that we save them. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is you're a vessel. If you've been saved in here today, every single one of us is a soldier. I preached about that a while back. We're also a vessel. And God is going to use you to take him to them. We are what he has chosen to do that. The church is what the vessel, the church is the tool that God uses to take him to them. You are the only Bible some people will ever see. And I'm telling you tonight, I'm telling you tonight, we need to debunk some dumb things. Don't just sit around and stew about it and talk to your other Christian friends about how stupid what they say it is. Pray for them. Try to be used in your workplace. Know what Christianity is and defend what it's not. Defend what it's not. If it's fun, let them know it's fun. If it's exciting, let them know it's exciting. And I promise you, when you show up to work, when you show up to your house, when you show up to your family, with that excitement in your heart and with that change in your life, it is so attractive to people. It is so attractive. I just love being around people like that. That's one thing I just love about this church. Is y'all know how to serve Christ and have fun. Amen. I mean, y'all do it in such a fun way. Now, we were talking about 5 o'clock the other day. Now, you can't go so far that you get irreverent with it. We, don't never, we always need to remember this is the house of God. We need to treat it like the house of God. But you can still have fun and do that. And I love the way you have fun. I mean, I love the way we have fun. Look over in the book of Acts. Look over in the book of Acts. I want you to look at something. I want you to look at one of the funnest things that went on. Book of Acts chapter 2. Book of Acts chapter 2. Man, the book of Acts is awesome. It is just so awesome. Look at verse 36 in chapter 2. It says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God hath made the same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is the end of Peter's sermon. He's just letting it rip. He's just letting it rip. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he did testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves in this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. How fun and exciting would that be? 3,000 people get saved. 3,000 people being baptized. I would look like a prickly pear. <laughs> Buddy, we'd have to take turns dunking them, son. You know what I mean? Can you imagine that? And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Think about how fun the fellowship is. Think about when we meet for our family night suppers. Think about Friday night when we come here and we have a good time and are entertained and just have a good time being together as Christian people. Have all the fun without the hangover. Amen. I mean, I'm telling you, it's a lot funner to wake up without your head hurt. It is. You got more money in your pocket. Or you've invested in heaven where it's going to last forever. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, a lot of fun without a hangover. A lot of fun without all the marriage problems. You get what I mean? A lot of fun with your kids a lot more steady and sturdy to take on this life. A lot of clean fun, a lot of good fun, but a lot of godly fun. They were having a lot of godly fun. Fellowship. They fellowship. Listen to what else it says. And breaking of bread. There is not a place in the world you can eat better than a Baptist church. I'm just straight telling you. This place will put 20 pounds on you in about a nanosecond. <laughs> Why are you all laughing? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate it every time you tell me that, Miss Nelly. Makes me feel good. <laughs> you help me out with that, Miss Nelly. <laughs> oh, goodness. Breaking of bread and in prayers. How sweet is it, man, to pray together? Now, how sweet is that? How sweet is that? How exciting is praying? How exciting was it whenever we prayed and God sent us his land? How exciting is that? How exciting is it when you pray for the souls of folks and you see them get baptized? How exciting is it when people are laying on their deathbed and God raises them up? How exciting is it whenever you pray for a family and God keeps their marriage together? How exciting is it when you pray for someone's kid and they get off dope? How exciting is that? How exciting is that? That's stuff you don't forget. That's stuff that means something forever. How exciting is it? How fun is it to pray? And see God work. Think about Peter and them boys walking around.